So let's kick things off and let me introduce you to today's keynote speaker. David Meerman Scott spotlighted the real-time marketing revolution in its infancy and wrote five books, including The New Rules of Marketing and PR, with more than 400,000 copies sold in English. They're also available in 29 languages from Albanian to Vietnamese. David now says the pendulum has swung too far in the direction of superficial online communication. Tech-weary and bot-weary people are hungry for true human connection. And organizations have learned to win by developing what David calls fanocracy. This is the subject of his Wall Street Journal bestseller book. Tapping into the mindsets of relationships with customers are more important than the products they sell to them. He's the author of Standout Virtual Events, How to Create an Experience That Your Audience Will Love, the first book to show people how to host and speak at virtual events in the post-COVID, in the COVID-19 era. Um, he's a massive music fan, and for those of you who don't know, he's been to over 790 live events since he was 15 years old, which is insane, and he's passionate about the Apollo Lunar Program, which is very cool, and he loves to surf, although, to be honest, I've heard he's not very good at it. So with all that said, I'm going to turn things over to David and have David take it away. David, welcome. Hey, thanks so much, um, Dana. It's a fabulous, fabulous to be here. And yeah, I'm not so great at surfing, but I absolutely love it. Um, so yeah, we're going to be spending some time today talking about this idea of how to make virtual events that your audience will love. And I'd like to start by asking each of you if you could please go down to the bottom of the Zoom panel, click the chat button, and enter into chat so that both panelists and attendees can see it, what you're a fan of, what you're a fan of. It could be a rock band. It could be a sports team. It could be a hobby you have. It could be a sport you love to play. It could be a company. It could be anything that you're a fan of. So please go ahead and put that into chat so we can see what it is. I'm seeing wine. I'm seeing live concerts. I'm seeing hiking. Love that. Um, skiing, chess, gardening, yoga, Netflix. So there are some of the things that we're fans of, and I can see it scrolling through a little bit more. Isn't that super cool? What we're going to be talking about for the next roughly 30 minutes are some of the ideas that I learned doing the research for the two books that I wrote that came out in 2020, Standout Virtual Events, Creating an Experience Your Audience Will Love, as well as Fanocracy, Turning Fans into Customers and Customers into Fans. And just so you know, I am a fan of live music, as Dana kindly says, especially The Grateful Dead. I've seen 75 Grateful Dead concerts, the first one when I was 17 years old, and I just spent $5,000 to buy another set of Grateful Dead tickets for a show that they're doing in early 2022 in Mexico. So that's my fandom, The Grateful Dead. My daughter, Reiko, who's my co-author on this book, Fanocracy, um, Reiko is a fan of Harry Potter. And not only has she read every book, seen every movie um, uh, multiple times, she wrote a novel, an 85,000 word alternative <clears throat> ending to the Harry Potter series where Draco Malfoy is a spy for the Order of the Phoenix. Put that on a fan fiction site. It's been downloaded thousands of times and commented on hundreds of times. So we came together to analyze this idea of fandom, how and why do people come together and love something? Like you just wrote in all of these different things that you love, cross-country skiing and chocolate and hiking and travel and all of the things that you love. Well, it turns out that each of us is hardwired. It's in our brains, it's in our DNA to want to be part of a tribe of like-minded people. Here's my tribe, my Grateful Dead fans at a Grateful Dead show a couple of years ago. You want to be part of a tribe of like-minded people because that's when you're safe and you're comfortable and you're secure. It goes back tens of thousands of years to when we roamed the woods and roamed the plains. Um, that's when we were safe, when we were with our own tribe. So what does that mean for us as we're creating virtual events? 
um, and hybrid events later on. What that means is how can you create a tribe of like-minded people? And I'll share some ways to do that. Here's our first polling question. If I can ask Dana to pop this up. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on this question. Are virtual events more or less intimate than in-person events? So if you could um, click one of those radio buttons and let us know what you think. Uh, are in-person events that we've done for decades more intimate than these virtual events that we've really kicked into gear um, since the pandemic started roughly in March? of 2020 was when I started to really dig into these ideas of virtual events. So I'm interested to know the results. Um, so when those are ready, Dana, if you could pop it up. And we're seeing what I see often, which is that 77% of us said that in-person events are more intimate. Um, and then there's a small number that says uh, they're about the same and that virtual are more intimate. Thank you. So I would like to try to share with you some reasons why I believe virtual events are more intimate. And it has to do with the neuroscience of proximity. So let me explain this idea. It turns out neuroscience tells us the closer we get to some other people who are part of our tribe, the more powerful the human connections. And if, we, if we're together with people who are away from our tribe, we can also have powerful connections in the other way. So at an in-person event, we're all part of the same tribe when we come together at an event like this. Um, we see the badge, we know where we're from, um, and we connect with people. We maybe, maybe never met them before, but they're part of the same tribe. It's super powerful. One neuroscientist whose name is Edward T. Hall looked at the various distances of proximity, one person to another, and identified that public space, which is about 12 feet away or further from another human, our brains don't track those people. So in other words, somebody on a stage when you're in the audience is not a close human connection. However, inside of 12 feet, we begin to track those people. We need to know, are they part of our tribe or not? That's what Edward T. Hall hall called social space, hence social distancing, keeping people that distance away, or personal space, which is four feet or closer. That's cocktail party distance at the events, cocktail reception, for example. That's when you're sitting next to somebody at an event, that same distance, personal space. That's where the most powerful human connections happen in an in-person event. But David, we're in a pandemic. What are you talking about? So here's another form of neuroscience that's super interesting that illustrates the concept of how virtual events can be incredibly intimate. And it's called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are the part of our brains that fire when we see somebody doing something as if we're doing it ourselves. which I'll demonstrate. I've got a, a full lemon here and a slice of lemon. And if I take a bite of this lemon, my brain will fire like crazy. So let's do that. Wow, it's my, I can feel it on my, my lips and on my tongue. My eyes are actually watering a little bit. My, my mouth is watering like crazy. It's super powerful to bite into a lemon, isn't it? And wasn't your brain firing too? Every single one of you, your brains were most likely firing because mirror neurons are firing because you've seen me bite into a lemon. This is the same concept that we can use to create an intimate virtual event because if you crop the camera angle like I'm doing right now, I'm looking directly at the camera, the camera is roughly at my eye level, I'm not looking down at you, I'm looking directly at the camera, um, that um, your brains are taking through mirror neurons as if I'm in the same room with you. Even though intellectually you know that I'm, I'm outside of Boston hundreds or thousands of miles away, your brain says that we're in the same room. That's precisely why you think you know a movie star or television star, even though intellectually you know you've never met them. So what does that mean for intimate 
virtual events. It means if you're cropping um, your speakers in this way, your speakers are looking directly at the camera. It's feeling like they're in the same room with the audience. Super powerful stuff that actually can create a super intimate event. I've got a number of different topics. This is the third one, a couple more to go. Um, and this, is, this concept is the difference between virtual and in-person. What I found early on in the pandemic, what people were doing was were taking what they knew about in-person events and stuffing it into a Zoom room. And that doesn't work. They're completely different things. Um, virtual events are way more like television than theater. It requires reimagining what an event is. And I'm coming at this from the perspective of a speaker, but clearly that's an important aspect of putting on a virtual event. Uh, when I speak at in-person events, I love to look into the back of the audience and see if I can get people in the back of the audience to participate just as much as those people in the front of the audience doing dumb things like jumping up and down, which is a little bit weird to do when you're in a virtual event. Um, and, um, and then uh, I can see if people are jumping up and down with me in the back. So here are some of those concepts of an invert in-person event. It's like a theatrical experience. Uh, as a presenter, put it, putting together a presentation like a three-act play, uh, use the entire stage, project so everybody in the audience can see you. Um, I can see the audience, I can hear the audience, I can sometimes even smell the audience and sense what they're thinking and what they're doing. Utterly different than what I'm doing right now as a speaker presenting in a virtual presentation. Virtual presentation, really different. Focus on that camera, as I talked about before. Create that intimate experience by, by being close to somebody virtually through mirror neurons, through that camera. So some of the things to be thinking about, the gestures, making things come alive in this small screen that you're looking at, putting together short segments with things like video and things to break it up like the polling and the chat that I've already done a couple of times. Um, um, amp up the emotions, play to the camera. I don't get much feedback. I'm seeing the chat a little bit if I look at the corner of my eye, but there really isn't much feedback doing a virtual event in the way that we're doing it right now. An important aspect, as you all know, of in-person events is audience interaction. How can you create an experience where the audience is creating that, um, that concept of a tribe, bringing people together? And I do some things from the stage, but all mostly that's happening away from the stage. Things like the cocktail receptions, the meal breaks, standing in line waiting for the doors to open to the ballroom, sitting next to somebody waiting for the lights to go down. Um, so I, sometimes I love to bring audience members up onto the stage and do a selfie with the rest of the audience in the background. Um, so that's how I can do interactive um, from a physical stage. And then, of course, you've got the exhibit floor where people can interact uh, with the exhibitors. You've got the snack breaks, the meal breaks, the cocktail receptions are all ways that individuals from the audience can interact with one another or interact with the speakers or the hosts of the event. But what does that mean for an, a virtual event? How can there be interaction? Um, and I've come up with a couple of ways, and, and there's many other ways, but I wanted to share with you a couple of ways. This is um, a stage that Tony Robbins built um, at a, a purpose-built studio uh, in Florida that I presented at a couple of different times, most recently last month. And if I, if I could ask uh, Dana to pop up the first video right now, I'm going to show you in this video a couple of ways to, that I do interaction to get that audience involved, to get people to be part of the experience, not just a passive listener, be part of that experience. So let's have that video if we can. 
um, now and I can show you some of this. Um, this studio is absolutely remarkable, by the way. The, um, the screens that I'm looking at are, um, are 20 feet high, they're uh, 50 feet around. I can see up to um, th uh, several thousand different people at once as I'm presenting. Um, Dana, do I want to, do you want me to present? Oh, you've got it going. Okay, great. No question in my mind. There is no question in my mind that you can achieve similar success. I want to do a selfie and get you guys into it. Can we do that? Who's up for that? You up for that? Okay, you're going to be into it. I see um, Kat Katerina with a yes. I see another yes. Let me see your yeses if you have one or wave. You're all going to be in this, all right? You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Awesome. So that's an example of how to bring interaction into the event. And the studio is built perfectly for that, that, I, that Tony, Tony Robbins has, and his team works with me to, to do these sorts of things. But there were something, nearly a thousand interactions on social media in that moment of doing that selfie. This is what I see as a presenter when I'm presenting in that way. So those of you who have big virtual events, um, I know some of you have built purpose-built purpose, purpose -built studios, but if you haven't, creating a fantastic purpose-built studio, multiple cameras, being able to see the audience in real time, being able to see the chat, which is what I can see over here, um, being able to zoom in and be able to talk to an individual person. These things are all amazing uh, around creating this fabulous interaction um, the way that um, I've been able and Tony Robbins has been able to create. So some of the things for virtual interaction we've been doing today. Um, chat, I asked you what you're a fan of. Q&A we're going to be doing shortly. Polling questions, we did one already. I've got another one coming up. Some uh, events using breakout rooms um, and also social media. Frequently using a hashtag can be super cool. This is an event I presented at called Skillsoft's uh, Perspective and they had 2,000 social shares uh, in 24 hours at this event on their hashtag, which is super cool. Uh, I spoke recently at Microsoft, not recently, it was last year, Microsoft Inspire, which is the Worldwide Partner Conference. And I had an opportunity to, to both co-present with and have a conversation with Bob Bijan. He runs a, a global events for the entire company for Microsoft. Uh, and he comes out of a television background, Hollywood background. And so we had some great conversations both on camera and off about virtual events. There I am doing my lemon thing uh, with Bob watching on. Uh, but some, some things that Bob says that I think are really interesting from the perspective of big companies like many of you who put on virtual events. What Bob told us is that the digital medium is way better than in-person for certain things like delivering information verbally together with additional supporting information that can drive you to action. Um, and when I asked him, how's it going, Bob? You know, you, you used to do, he used to do his, his department and the people who work with him 300 in-person events a year. Now they're all digital. At least, for, at least for the near term, he said, David, it's going great. He says, our feedback from the audience at our digital events has been over, overly, overwhelmingly positive. So the main thing here that all of these ideas are doing is how can you reimagine what's possible in virtual events, rather than simply taking what you already know and stuffing it into a virtual platform. Uh, it's reimagining. Here's another thing to think about, the power of surprise. You know, how can you do something unexpected in a virtual event. Um, sometimes I bring in people that um, are completely unexpected as a guest speaker um, or perhaps even a musical guest. And I'd like to share with you another quick video now of a surprise guest um, that we uh, set up for the Skillsoft Perspectives 2020 event. Um, and it was a musical guest, they're called Black Violin. 
and uh, they did a, a, a song and then I did some Q&A with them. I'm just gonna show you a very short, um, small cut version of it, but people love this kind of interaction. So Dana, I'm ready when you are. I'm super excited, super excited that we're going to hear some music from Will Patiste and Kev Marcus. Take it away, Black Violin. Hey guys, how you doing? What's up everybody? That was how is everybody doing today? Doing great. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. Will, I, I, I'm hearing the dance music going on. Uh, is that, um, do you purposely build those bass drops in and things like that? <laughs> you gotta keep you moving, you know, you yeah. gotta keep you uh, dancing. I mean, it's, it's very different when it comes to, uh, you don't think of the violin as dance music, so, you know. We try to push the envelope as, as much as we can. Our entire focus is always kind of about trying to break those perceptions of what is possible. So that worked out great. Is I was in a studio here in Boston, multiple cameras, big sets, um, and Black Violin was in their studio in Florida. They did the performance. They just did one song to begin with. I did a little bit of a Q and A, um, and then they came back and did a different, uh, another performance afterward. It worked out great. People loved it. The people didn't drop off. They wanted to stay and watch that. It was super cool. The final concept that I want to spend just a moment on is this idea of passion. Because Reiko and I, when we were working on this book, Fanocracy, um, and Dana will talk to you later about how you can get a copy. Um, this, I this idea of fanocracy was that um, we looked at how and why people can build fans of a business, of a company, of, a, of an event, or, of a, or using events um, to build fans. And why do people become fans of something? Yes, there's some neuroscience aspect and we interviewed neuroscientists, which was great. We interviewed a whole bunch of people about what they're a fan of, like many, many of you who put in, in into chat what you're a fan of. And we talk with companies who have built massive fandoms. But the thing that was most interesting and surprising to us was the importance of passion. And it turns out when we live a passionate life and we make that passion shine through in everything that we do in the events we produce and the speakers um, when they're sharing their passion, people are more likely to become fans. It's super, super interesting. Um, so that brings me to another polling question. Um, this polling question is, on your business social media, so if that would be like LinkedIn or if you use Twitter for business, on your business social media, um, do you share personal things like what you're a fan of? So th those things that you put in at the very beginning of my talk, what you're a fan of, do you share the things you love in your personal life on your business social media? And I'm interested to see uh, what the results are here. I've seen some very consistent results. I've done this poll and maybe a hundred different times and I've seen very consistent results. So let's see what this audience um, comes up with uh, as far as your, as your results. Um, and no matter what you put, what I'd encourage you to think of, Dan, Dan I'd love to see the results. Um, what I encourage you to think of, yes, and this is very similar to what I normally see. I'm an old man. I have to wear my glasses to see this. <laughs> um, uh, about half of us never, um, another 30, 40% seldom. So way more than three quarters, well, about three quarters of us either never or seldom share those things we're a fan of on our business social media. I would like to suggest to you and encourage you to think of this in a different way. If you do share what you love, the things that you're passionate about, you become an interesting person, someone who attracts fans. Here's just an example of this concept of mixing business and personal lives on social media. In my case, I mentioned to you that I'm a huge fan of live music. Um, it turns out I'm the only person known to have taken photographs at Bob Marley's last concert. And it was 40 years ago, last September. And I posted a photograph that I took on my social network works and I had 10,000 views, hundreds of people talking about it because 
that's interesting, David. You're a you you were the only person who shot in the known photos of Bob Marley's last concert. Those photos have become totally famous. They're used um, uh, at they're actually at the theater, Stanley Theater in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the Bob Marley family has them. They're uh, showcased in the Marley documentary. Um, this is Michelle. Um, and she's at Skillsoft. She runs marketing at Skillsoft. Among other things, she runs um, their uh, events part of their business. And at Skillsoft, um, Michelle is famous among internal people as well as external people for her absolute love of Peloton. Oh my God, she is a massive, massive Peloton fan. And she shares her love of Peloton from the stage. She shares her love of Peloton on her social media. This is um, us co-presenting at that same event where we had Black Violin appear. And I actually, I think it was at this point in the presentation, I was asking Michelle about Peloton and she just comes alive when she talks about Peloton. Uh, here's her LinkedIn, she's sharing Peloton uh, and she shares her Peloton on Twitter. So this idea of sharing what you're passionate about is a super cool and interesting way to build fans, both from the stage, as well as um, building and sharing fans um, through social media. And when people are attracted to this, when they're attracted to you because of these things you share, you're much more likely to have events people love and to have um, people be attracted to what you do. So uh, I'm David Merriman Scott. Um, Dana, thank you so much um, to Kon Interactive for sponsoring this and for asking me to come and speak. I, I actually love this stuff. Um, and I'm happy to pass over to you now. Fabulous. Thank you so much, David. Um, and just a reminder to people, if you have any questions for the presenters, please feel free to put them in the QA and we'll ask them at the end of the event. I know we do have um, one question, at least that came in for David. Jen, Absolutely. do you want to take it away? Yep, let me just pull this up here. So David, we have a question from Mark. Um, Mark asks, how should we prepare um, our event speakers to translate typical uh, in-person analog presentations into this new digital format? Um, I really want them to be comfortable presenting in a digital environment. Yeah, great question from Mark, thank you. Um, so there's a few things. I would say there's the technology involved and then there's the technique involved. So from the technology perspective, it's super important that um, that you have the right kind of thing to make the speaker look good. Um, lighting, sound, camera, um, and that the room environment looks, uh, uh, looks good, looks appropriate. Um, personally, I like to have the camera at eye level. Um, I like to have, I have a ring light um, over here on the side of me. Um, I have, a, I can show you my microphone. I have a little microphone here that's above me, um, which makes the sound good. One of the big problems that people have is sound. Uh, you know, using the earbud things doesn't great, create as great sound as if you use an external microphone. I'm actually using a GoPro um, camera right now as my webcam. Um, GoPro very recently um, created a, an, uh, an app that you can download that's free to make the GoPro go into um, uh, your computer and then become your webcam. And I think that the, the, the quality is quite good for the price. Um, and then I would encourage you to have at least one, if not several technology checks with that person to make sure that the, um, the, the technology that you're giving them or the technology that they've purchased is going to work well. I know some organizations that actually create a box of all of this equipment. They have a microphone, they have a camera, they have a ring light, uh, and they send that out so that people um, are able to plug it in. Then they do a couple of different sound checks to make sure everything works. So that's the technology side. Then on the presenting side, uh, you know, work with those speakers so that they're looking at the camera, they're not looking down, um, that that camera, um, uh, it becomes the thing that they connect with. Um, and then maybe do a couple of rehearsals if you can to make sure that, that they're able to uh, present in, in this particular way. Um, you know, I, I would encourage everybody to think about what is the best way to, to deliver slides as well. And you'll notice that 
I've got another computer that drives my slides and that secondary computer driving another a screen like this. So my slides are over my shoulder. That means that I'm big and I'm here and I'm present as opposed to some of the, the platform defaults where the slides are big and the person is small as a thumbnail. Um, that's a personal preference, um, uh, but to me that tends to work pretty well. I know that some organizations, and I've shared two of them, actually I've shared three of them, Microsoft, Skillsoft, and Tony Robbins actually use a purpose-built studio that you could either rent or if you're like Tony Robbins, um, and, I'm, and Microsoft has done this too, I believe, um, create your own purpose-built studio that you own, that you bring people into for the virtual events. And then you've got multiple ways to do it. So bit bigger challenge if the person is at home. I think, I think um, educating the speaker, preparation, and doing a technology, at least one, if not several technology checks is the way to go.